it's time for a base day. We've got two very different flavors of base. Up first is this Gibson Grabber. What a name. It, it had a sister model called the Ripper. It seems like someone let Stan Lee into the production meeting, because, you know, these seem like comic book villain names. It's the Grabber. They were introduced together in 1973, which was a pretty good year for record releases. Look it up. A lot of classics that year. Anyway, Gibson needed something a little different from the EB series that went before. Those bases all look, well, basically like SGs with long necks. It's a cool design, but they wanted something updated and hip for the 70s. So they went with this shape, which, you know, it has a little bit of that SG DNA in it, particularly the heavy angle chamfered edge treatment. Uh, it's a wide-bodied base. It's definitely 70s. Of the two models, the Grabber here was less expensive. It's got a single pickup, one volume, one tone. Pretty bare bones. But the gimmick is that the pickup's on a sliding tray. And you can dial in the ultimate personal tone position. Which I don't think happens all that often. I mean, there's no changing this between songs. You know, it gets put in one place and it stays there while you play. The Ripper looked similar to this, but it had two fixed position pickups rather than the sliding one. It also had slightly more fancy electronics, including a mid-range control, which is pretty useful. These bases tend to be a little bit brighter than Gibson's previous stuff. Uh, the pickups, which are big humbuckers, well actually the whole guitar was designed by Bill Lawrence, who some of you will know. Bill was one of the early sort of, I don't know if you call him a boutique pickup designer, but he worked for a number of different companies in the 60s and 70s. And these are known as super humbuckers. I think these basses were pretty well received in their time, and they had decent sales. The Ripper got used by a whole lot of bands. Uh, as for the Grabber here, slightly less expensive, so I think the punks liked them. Um, Grabber players of note would be Mike Durnt of Green Day in his earlier years. Uh, Chris Novoselic of Nirvana. But back in the 70s... The major poster boy of these things, the real mover of material, Gene Simmons of KISS. A couple of years later they made a three pickup version of this called the G3 that had uh, three uh, non-movable pickups. All of the bases lasted until the early 80s. You know, so they were around for a decade and then gone. There have been a couple of reissues though. Interestingly, but maybe not too surprising, as this is a Norlin-era Gibson product. We have a bolt-on neck. Very different for Gibson. Despite the bolt-on, and the fact that this has a straight, non-angled head, um, these are pretty renowned for having broken headstocks. I, myself, have affected three different headstock repairs on these bases. One of them was a rebreak. Um, so, you know, it's true. You really can't get away from the Gibson curse. This is slightly lower than the plane of the body, as this is a very thin base. So if it falls, it breaks. Kind of a cool modern headstock. What's it need? Well, it desperately needs a setup. Because we're looking at 10 64ths on the base side, 8.5 on the treble. As for the neck relief, I haven't even measured it because it's so big. Um, we're hoping that it's got a decent truss rod in this one. Um, the other thing is, someone at some point has put little stickers all over it to make the uh, position markers more apparent, I guess, on a dark stage. I don't know. So we're going to remove those, and hopefully there's nothing hiding under them. And on the back side here, you might have seen, there is some buckle wear, and in the middle of that, etched in with blue ballpoint pen, are some position instructions for both D-sharp and A-sharp which happen to fall in the places you'd expect them. But can you imagine, you know, playing somewhere and turning your bass over to find A-sharp? I'm going to answer a few questions today as well. The first I seem to be getting asked a lot lately, and I don't really understand what's generating that. Uh, I've covered it before. Maybe it's time for a refresher. And that is, what brand of lemon oil do I use on fretboards? And let me preface by saying I don't think it matters very much. They're all pretty similar. Lemon oil is a trade term. It's not actually the oil from lemon skins, it's mineral oil. It's basically unscented baby oil with the addition of artificial lemon scent to it. What does it do? It gives the fretboard a little bit of luster after I've been doing fret work or cleaning. It revives the color. 
Does it moisturize the wood? Well, you know, there's no water in the product. It can slow down the transfer of moisture between the wood and the air for a short time. Uh, it can also be a moderately okay cleaning agent in that it mixes with the oily aspect of uh, finger or fretboard grunge, basically. It lets you move it around, but it's not really great at it. It's not like a, a good solvent. Um, it superficially soaks into the surface and wets it and then basically goes away after, depends on atmospheric conditions, but a week or two. I only use a very small amount. You know, I've been working on this same can for 12 years. That's thousands of guitars. So this size is overkill for your average player. Uh, this one is from a company called Circa 1850. I like it. Dunlop makes a much smaller and very affordable bottle of very similar product that you can buy in a lot of guitar shops or online. It's called Formula 65. That works just fine. Now this is different from my initial treatment of fretboards. When I'm making a guitar or after doing something like resurfacing the board during a refret, for that I use what's called a drying oil or a polymerizing oil. I like polymerized tongue oil. This one's tongue and teak oil. There are various formulas. Another brand might be calling it Danish oil. Boiled linseed oil also falls into that category. These are oils that cure into something with a semi-firm surface. You can see the stuff that's on the top here over time has become a film and it's actually quite tough versus the lemon oil. So that should tell you something. You put it on the wood, you let it soak in, and then you wipe off all of the excess. Because if you don't, over time it gets sticky. But what this does is it floods the open pores of the wood and it hardens in there and it creates sort of a durable, mm, semi-permeable barrier for moisture in the most uh, open pathway for you know moisture to leave the wood through the pores. You only have to do it a couple of times at the very beginning of the guitar's life. So you don't see me advocating for its use like twice a year to quote unquote condition the wood. Although it will work for that. It'll do exactly the same thing as the lemon oil. But again, if it's not wiped completely off the surface, it will build into a sticky, messy film over time. Uh, that's not going to happen with lemon oil. It doesn't build up. So... <sighs> The average player will put on way too much, and they won't remove enough of this stuff. And lemon oil is actually a little bit cheaper, so... I'll check the neck relief. Twenty-six thousandths. This is another of those guitars where they physically bend the truss rod cover up into an arc, which always looks a little bit weird to me. Rather than a hex nut, they've got a fender style nut with a slot adjustment. Well, there's virtually no tension on the rod. Okay, after several bouts of cranking, uh, I took this to the point where I got scared, which is an obvious stopping place. And with that, I managed to bring the neck relief down to about 11 thousandths at the 7th fret, which is, eh, that's okay. It's alright, but this is at the very end. It's maxed. Another quarter turn and it's going to break which you don't want to have happen. Um, I would say that it's really important. Guitars, some guitars manage to get through their lives without ever having a truss rod adjustment. But basses, man, you got to kind of keep after it. And in a situation where you've got no tension on the rod, really weird things can happen. So I would say it's one of those things, that's, it's a good idea to have it checked once a year, just to make sure that nothing funny is happening. I think we're going to get away with it this time. Rather than 10 64ths, we're now at 8 and just over 6 on the treble, so that has to come down a little bit more. They were really anticipating a lot of adjustment. Look at those. Notes for fretting out in the upper positions here. Uh, that's because the end of the fingerboard is kicked up slightly, which happens on a whole lot of uh, bolt-on neck guitars. And even without string tension, I can see that the last two frets are very much higher than the ones before. So we're going to have to dress these down a little bit. So there are pearl dots under there. And this stuff has um, a plastic coating which is
pretty tough to get through, and the adhesive is, well, I don't think there's any other way to do it other than just sort of pick. It's a glamorous profession, people. I had another question from a young guy who's just getting into repair work, trying to push past the basic sort of setups and into the more hair-raising fast lane of repairs like this one. Um, he asked me, how do I turn down a job? Is there something that I do? So he wants to know the formula. You know, he's aware of his limitations and uh, he doesn't really want to overreach too fast, you know. And as luck would have it, uh, I have a heck of an illustration that happened, well, it showed up the same day. Now, I probably turned down more guitar repairs than basically anyone living because of YouTube. Uh, at this point, it's way, way more than the number I actually take on. So, it was more than 3,000 times last year. And the bulk of those are people who live too far away. Uh, they just don't realize the cost, you know, what it takes to get a guitar to and from Canada if they live in, like, Norway. So, well, there are also jobs that, you know, I don't think I'm especially skilled at. And others I just, you know, I just don't want to do. So, that takes up a lot of time, actually. Because I also get about the same number from people who are... Uh, they just want to talk to me, you know, technical questions, they want to pat me on the back, um, that kind of thing. It's 6,000 emails in total, which average time spent on them, like, in any given interaction is probably um, two minutes-ish. So that would be 12,000 minutes um, divided by 60 is 200 hours divided by 8 for the theoretical average work day of like an office worker. <laughs> and that works out to be, well, it's more than four weeks. It's like five whole weeks of labor that, you know, it's kind of like theoretically unpaid labor um, that is spent disappointing people and saying, nope, not going to work on your guitar. Um, so the long and the short of it is I tell people something along the lines of, you know, I'm sorry, this is not a job that I can take on at this time, or I don't think this is the job for me for various reasons, it doesn't fit my skill set, or, you know, I think you'd be better served finding someone who lives in your country. That's it. It's short and sweet. It, it works. Most people understand. When you're starting out, it feels terrible to turn down work uh, at all because you feel like you might not get another job. But in this business, it's necessary. Because sometimes you want to find sort of a gentle way to tell someone that their guitar is worth 200 bucks, and even though it's very sentimental, they would be better off putting that money to something else, you know? Um, the beginner also has to keep from trying to tackle a job that's too advanced for them. And that's not easy, because you do have to judge your own skills. Anyway, I've been watching videos here on YouTube uh, from a channel run by a guy named James Butler. And James is a partner and an operator in a business that deals with pumping out septic tanks, which is a very necessary job in rural areas. But, you know, you gotta, you got to figure that you're going to become slightly philosophical when you're doing that job. And after about 10 or 12 videos, I discover the fact that he's actually you got a degree in philosophy, which sort of tracks. But um, he goes into detail about working with idiosyncratic customers, weird employees, the daily grind of actually running a business. And he does it in this really interesting deadpan, sort of taciturn way that speaks to me, right? So in that vein, and springboarding off of Josh's question there, the other day a fellow emails me, looking for me to work on two different electric guitars. Contact page on my website says I'm not taking new work at this time. That doesn't stop people. So he says he's taken them to other repair guys in his town, which is about half an hour away, and he's been unsatisfied because a month later they always end up buzzing and not performing right. And he says that they all say I'm the best, so he's going to bring these guitars to me. Novice guitar people should listen close to this one because it's probably the most valuable 
pieces of business information I can give, and I've heard it from other veterans. Evan Gluck from New York Guitar Repair often drives this home. That there are red flags in the communication that you receive about a repair that you need to become sensitive to. And I'll tell you, in my book, the number one thing that has predicted problems every single time is someone who disparages your so-called competitors while trying to get you to do work for them. Because dollars to donuts, if they badmouth them, they're going to turn around and do the same about you. Right? Sometimes this is accompanied by another ploy that um, relationship psychologists these days are referring to as love bombing, where they'll heap a bunch of praise on you and put you on this impossibly high pedestal. Um, that is a setup, because you won't be able to live up to expectations. No one has ever satisfied these people before, and you're no different. And when you don't, guess what? You become another of those hack losers who don't know how to repair guitars. It's like the incel mentality where a guy asks a girl out on a date, and you know if she declines, he immediately starts hurling a whole bunch of degrading insults her way, emphasizing that she's disgusting, this person he supposedly wanted to date a minute before. It's a self-burn, but it's also reprehensible. So I replied that I'm sorry, I'm not taking on any work at this time because I'm basically booked up through the year, which is true, kind of. Well, it's September. I know pretty much what I'm doing every week until September. I also pointed out that when I set up a guitar, I follow the same routine that everyone else does. You know, there's nothing magical about my setups. And I also mentioned that if the problems keep arising uh, a month after the work, that there might be an issue with the parameters he has with the uh, action height. You know, because, well, there are a lot of people who throw out that phrase as low as possible without buzzing when it comes to action, not reckoning on the fact that it's a razor's edge, right? Where the slightest change in humidity or temperature can bring about the buzz. This is why touring pros who shred pay somebody to be backstage and adjust their guitars every single time they perform. Because, um, unfortunately, you know, many guitars can't maintain the level of stability required for action that is, you know, a 32nd of an inch or under. You know, Well-built well guitars from good companies. You know? So, I said, he, you know, he might go back to the people who did the work previously and just ask them again and just make sure that you know, they understood what they, he needed out of his guitar. Anyhow, he didn't email me back, but I got a notification later that night from someone who put a new Google review up. And this is what it says. So that's the response you get when you don't do someone's work. Uh, my point being, as an independent repair person, you're going to encounter people like this, and there's no getting around it. Can't go over, can't go under. If you do the work, it's going to be a bad experience. If you decline the work, though, it's going to be a bad experience. <sighs> but also, oh yeah, if you confront them in any way, you're feeding into the complex that makes them behave in this fashion, because you know they go through life doing this to every person they can. So there's no winning. You, just, you have to chalk it up and move on. Now, I mean, circumstances are such that a bad Google review or two isn't going to affect my business. Uh, for a long time, there wasn't even the choice to dispute or edit those things, like on Facebook or, or Google. So, you know, if you're just starting out, that would cause great despair. That's a really bad day for some kid who's trying to do his best to get into work. Um, I'm tempted to leave it up because I find it amusing in a true... Camus-like display of absurdism, because, ironically, if it dissuades a few customers from contacting me, I might not have to expend time telling them that I can't take on their jobs. The other thing you should know is that, by and large, uh, guitar repair people don't compete. Everyone I know who does decent work is 
burning out right now, to be honest, from having too much of it the last couple of years. And so we commiserate more than compete. Uh, I don't know everyone in my area, but the ones that I do, we're all congenial. And there's a grapevine, right, of knowledge and parts. That comes in handy. And um, well, bad experiences, weird customers. So if you're insulting a repair person, you're probably insulting the friend of the next guy you're going to take it to. Another pointer I should make for the aspiring types who are just getting in, uh, which is really hitting home for me right now, uh, when you're getting started, it's hard enough to imagine saving for retirement. But if you're in a self-directed creative business like this, you should also immediately start putting away something to give yourself sick days. Because they're going to happen eventually. For the past couple of months, uh, I've been dealing with a couple of conditions which put together are legitimately life-threatening. In an OBS kind of way. That aren't responding to the usual medications and stuff. That means a whole bunch of trips to various clinics for scans and tests and... Devochkas like to piercing me until the red red crovy starts to flow. And that takes a whole bunch of time out of the shop. And you add to that days when I simply just, you know, I have to fall down for a while and ride out the fatigue. So you have to be prepared for this, you know. You're going to be in charge of your own sick pay, and there better be some there when you need it. Something weird going around the uh, bottom of the knobs here. These have the finger shredder style marker washers with a little point on them. I don't know, maybe someone tried to polish this at some point and didn't get it all away. So, see if we can pop those off and clean those up a bit. I'll point out that this originally had a front facing jack which might have gotten in the way of someone's savage thrashing, and uh, so they changed it for a side mount one. And this being Canada, there has to be at least one oddball Robertson green screw. The underside of the pick guard is full of this gray... I'm going to assume it's polishing compound. I'm going to squirt some stuff in those uh, control pots. And here's the track. It's just really simple. It's The pickup has been placed into um, a routed slot in the wood. There's the underside. In a staggering disregard for history, the owner decided he didn't want that uh, annotation left on the back of this thing, so I'm taking it away. Just use some nasty, dirty dust for my vacuum cleaner and a finger full of the drying oil this time. There's the tongue oil. And that'll add a little bit of age. So yeah, the height adjustment screws on this are absurdly long. Um, they would have to come off if this didn't have a cover plate. But uh, they are sufficient that I can get the saddles down where I need them, and we end up with decent action. And I don't have to shim the neck, which is a blessing. Um, however, the E-string, one of the screws, seems to have broken off on the top there, and there is no more adjustment slot for the screwdriver. So I'll have to cut that in with my uh, Dremel. Despite my preliminary efforts, there's still a lot of buzz. This is almost meditative. Okay, the frets on this board are generally quite high at about 40 thousandths of an inch. That's basically the height of a new fret. Um, in order to get this done, I have taken off just about 20 thousandths, or half their height. This last fret is practically decorative at this point. Um, you know, and it's sloped down 
fall away, basically. It's not fall away in this case because the board is rising. So this is kind of putting things in the same plane to level them off. And up next we have a Fender product. This is a precision base, a P base. The actual date, eh, kind of hard to say. I think the body is from the 70s. The serial number on the neck plate suggests 1972, but it's been stripped bare by its bachelors even, and the neck on this is fretless. And is this a real Fender neck, or maybe it was stripped off and stuff was lost along the way? Um, that decal there is in the wrong place. It's certainly missing a lot of information. Should be down closer to the point on the swoopy thing here. Um, there's also a couple of weird previously drilled and plugged holes around the E-string. Don't know what those are from. The other thing is it's got some theoretical fret positions on the board, or previously it was fretted with standard frets removed and uh, veneer was put in the slots. But um, I don't believe that Fender ever put fret markers on the actual boards. This has got perloid fret dot markers. It's got white binding, and there don't seem to be any side dot markers. These have been added by the owner. Looking at some examples online, I think it would have had markers, but they would have been down in the wood below the board. And of course, as I said, it wouldn't be bound. So these dots have just been put on there with pen, and the owner would like something other than pen. He'd also like to know if I can do something about marking the actual fret positions as well. You know, he's got the pen dots on there for each fret, but he was wondering if he could get lines instead. And, I mean, we debated that. It would not be an easy thing to jig up, as this has, you know, the radius on the fretboard and another on the side of the neck, so registration becomes a real issue to get sort of consistent lines. Uh, I'd have to build a really elaborate cradle uh, to work with a router, and even then I'd worry that it'd be accurate enough. So I threw out the idea of scrimshaw to him. And that's the term for incising or etching lines in materials like bone or ivory. It's a traditional craft from the time of sailing ships. You know, it's something that can also be done on plastic, so we're going to give that a try. The old joke is that a fretless precision base is kind of an oxymoron, right? Because the frets are what gave it the precision. Uh, but they're fun. The precision is the original first market accepted bass guitar. This is the original design, kind of. Uh, there were some changes in the mid-50s that took it from being sort of a slab-sided Telecaster to something more sexy like a Strat. But since that time, these things have remained pretty much unchanged from the era of Buddy Holly. Some of you are going to ask why I don't just take the neck off to check the end date on that and see whether it's a Fender product or not. The thing is, this has got flat wound strings on it, and according to the owner, they are very, very, very old strings. And he actually likes the tone that they have, and he kind of wants me to save them, don't take them off. And uh, so I'm going to basically keep them on while I do the work, because taking off and putting back on flat wound strings can sometimes be a, well, it's never a great idea to remove guitar strings and then try to reuse them. But in this case, I think that would be devastating to their character. So we're going to hold on to these probably 90s vintage strings. Let's try various cleaning agents to see which one will work. Bet you it's going to be alcohol. Naphtha does very little. Ooh, white lightning. Yeah, that's the stuff. Ethanol. Don't use acetone. That would be bad. Okay, I practiced this for several minutes on some spare binding to make sure it would work. This is the scratch tool I use for cleaning out fret slots. It's about 22 thousandths wide, just over half a millimeter, which is uh, probably about the same width as the slots on the board. I can just line it up. I've got my small sliding 
square I'm just going to several passes to make a slightly incised line. I'm honing frequently. I think the most accurate way to do this is probably put your marking tool on the line you want to cut and then slide the square up to it. Try to hold things vertically. And the first pass should be very light. Just relax as a guideline. This is a Pigma Micron pen. Uh, where's your base? I don't know. I think I left it at the airport. I'm going to go with 1 16th inch dots. That's just about one and a half millimeters. I use the short bit over the bulk of the neck. Over the body I've got one that's six inches long, which is really handy for this kind of thing. In go the little plastic rods with some super glue. Clip them off, let them dry. Then come back and chisel off the excess. I'll do a little bit of light sanding as well. To protect and fill up the engraved lines, I'll rub on some pure carnauba wax, which is clear when it's very thin and super hard. Probably harder than the binding. There we go. Much more legible. Let's hear how these fantastic basses sound through an inexpensive guitar amp. <laughs> 